Just wanna talk to you, you know? So so laid back for the Lord, you know? I'm gonna talk to you for a minute. Listen. Let me talk to you. Can I talk to you? Stop, sit down, let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. Can I talk to you? I got something to say, so let me talk to you. Let me talk to you. Put a spark to you. Without Christ, watch things get dark to you. On the block, they throw slugs like quarterbacks. There's only one God, Jesus Christ, that's a fact. No questions, no guessing. Read the scriptures, then you learn your lessons. Devil's testing me, but the sword on my side. Spiritual warfare, strapped up, ready to ride. This is not religion, this relationship. If you're not saved, you ain't gonna be feeling this. I'm talking born again, redeemed by the blood. The Lord of hosts, that's a godly love. That means God's love, not like the world. Not like your man, understand baby girl We need some salvation from contamination You can have the Lord, so why you waiting? Let me talk to you, can I talk to you? Stop, sit down, let me talk to you Amen, Amen. 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 Amen, bro Amen, Amen, bro No other name, no other name, no other name Amen, amen, amen We can ready to get it popping here Um Okay, I want to open up with a small prelude uh, to the message. You know, years ago, uh, I remember I shared the message when we were very young in the ministry, just starting out in my living in my living room, and we didn't have, you know, wasn't no YouTube, none of this stuff. We were all in the living room sharing the word, and I shared the word about, and it came to me this morning about hold hold your ground, right? Hold your ground. Um, being that we are, you know, uh, in the Old Testament, everything, you know, it was a lot of supernatural things going on. We're going to constantly, in the Old Testament, you're going to constantly go from the natural to the supernatural. Like, God is supernatural. So, super, anytime God is actively on the scene or involved, you can expect the supernatural to happen, right? So, um, but my point is, is that there's a lot of wars. There was a lot of wars being fought constant. You know, um, in the Old Testament, it's literal. You know, they did literal battle. In the New Testament, we do spiritual battle. Um, uh, Paul says, you know, arm yourselves that our weapons are not cardinal, but it's spiritual pulling down strongholds that Satan has. Satan has a lot of strongholds in our lives and our minds. You know, everywhere around us that we got to pull down constantly. We're constantly at, at battle as well, not literally, but spiritually. Um, back then for them, everything was literal, right? The battles were literal and the things were literal. But one thing that God had showed me years ago is about, and this is what I want to share, it's about hold your ground, right? When they came into enemy territory, you know, even even when the United States, I'm just making a point, when they went into invaded Normandy, they just didn't take over the whole, you know, uh, 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 no, you know, German uh, area, the way the Germans controlled, they didn't take it over in one day. They took piece by piece. You get in, you take a little ground, you hold that ground. You don't lose the ground you take. You hold on to that ground, and then you get a little more ground until you take over everything, right? See, they were very strategic. And even back then, they would come in and, you know, the Philistines, they would take some of their ground, hold that ground, and then vice versa. The Philistines would do that to the children of Israel as well, but they will hold the ground. And once you get that ground, you don't lose it. I think the problem with us in the spiritual battles that we fight, we lose a lot of ground. We'll get ground, and then lose that ground, and then keep having to take that same ground over and over again, right? In other words, we'll get some ground, we'll get a little bit of spiritual growth, or we'll, you know, God will take us a little further in, a little deeper in, and, and then immediately we'll lose that ground, right? We'll lose it. We won't hold it. And then again, we keep battling and fighting and taking the same ground over and over again. When we're supposed to get that ground, hold it. Don't go backwards. Hold it. Even if we can't go forward, you know, sometimes Satan puts up a big battle. There's times the United States was stuck for years. They 
be stuck for a long time before they can get more ground. But they wouldn't lose the ground that they took. And same, you know, you know, in these battles that we're reading, reading about with the children of Israel and their enemies. See, the object of the game is to get ground, of course. But once we get the ground, don't lose the ground. You hold that ground. Don't surrender it where you have to keep tanking. I'm being redundant here. The same ground over and over again. So that's something, you know, to think about. When we get ground in Christ and God allows us to get to a certain level spiritually and we, you know, don't go backwards, guys. Don't relinquish it. You stay there as long as you can until you could get some more ground. Amen? That's what I want to say today. Uh, Brother Rick, read 15, 1 through 3. Samuel also said unto Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus said the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, I laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Technically, what did God say? I want y'all to go and kill everything moving. Everything walking and crawling. Kill it all, right? Um, I remember I was debating a guy uh, years ago. And he said he didn't understand how God told the children of Israel, thou shalt not kill. And then right after that, he told them to go up in the land and, and kill everything moving. And he said, well, what, you know, God wants us to kill or you don't want us to kill. But they don't understand um, that that meant within their congregation, within their uh, uh, fellowship. There were protocols, there were laws that governed them. When he spoke about the enemies of God, right, it was a different program. It was a whole different thing. This is what people fail to realize. God did tell them to go up in the land of Canaan, kill men, women, pregnant women, everybody. It didn't matter because he knew that those babies would grow up and keep killing their baby. Now, something we have to understand, again, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And I mean, the uh, I said it wrong. I said, the um, yeah, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. Right. Some of these answers here um, are answered in the New Testament. And that's when I want to kill you now, Mike. Read Matthew 13, 38 through 30. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of age, and the reapers are the angels. Verse 40 says, Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so Will it be at the end of this age? You can stop there, Mike. The point is, it says, in the King James, it says, the good seed are the children of God, and the tares are the seed of the enemy. Like, Satan has a seed, my point, and God has a seed, right? Satan has a seed. This is what people fail to realize, right? Satan has children, too. And he brings his children up against the children of God. Back then, it was technically literally, literal. Even today, Satan's children are spiritual. But see, the spiritual is more strategic. Literal, you know when somebody's coming to kill you. you they technically understood what God was saying because they attacked them time and time again. These The Malachites were horrible people. They were wicked people. And they constantly came at God's people. Any chance they get, they will kill them without mercy. And God understood that Malachites had to be wiped out completely, right? But today is a little different. You know, um, when it says that the, Satan has a seed, um, God is letting you know that right then and there that Satan has children too, right? Meaning that spiritually they're, they're more of a threat now than back then because we spiritually, we don't know who Satan's children are. We really, I mean, we know if we're born again, we can recognize them. But some of our best friends belong to him. Some of our family members belong to him, right? 
some of the people we love, respect, we care about, we want to be with, the women we 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 want to give our lives to, and whatever the case, they belong to him, right? And they're a threat to us, period. No matter how you cut it, they're a threat to us. And when somebody's a threat to you, back then they eliminated those threats. Um, today we kind of embrace them and, you know, we harness them. But the point I want to make is that Satan has to see. And this is what people fail to realize that God loves everybody. You know, I remember Jesus said this and it went over a lot of people's heads and it still does today. He says, I pray not for the world, only for those that, that you have given me in John, I believe chapter 17. He said, only for those that you have given me. That's what I pray for. So God's children are constantly divided from the enemy's children. Satan's seed was trying to wipe out the children of Israel completely. So God dealt with them very harshly, very harshly. And there was people, there was, there was unbelievers God showed mercy to. And there, was, uh, there were unbelievers that converted into Judaism, whole nations back then. I'm not saying that God just wiped out anything and everything, but he knew who would continue to attack his people, you know, throughout generations. And the Malachites don't exist today. They were eventually wiped out by the children of Israel. I'm just, you know, giving you, letting you know what's going on here. So God told him, go up in the land of Canaan, right? And kill everything uh, moving. And um, he said, don't spare any. All right, we can keep reading. Verse four on down to eight, Rick. And Saul gathered the people together and numbered them in Telem. 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to a city, of a city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. And Saul said unto the Kenites, Go, depart, get you down from among the Am Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For ye showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul smote the Amalekites from Havilah until thou comest to Shur, that is over against Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refused that they destroyed utterly. You can stop there, brother. Okay, um, Saul played himself right there, but big time. I mean, big time. But um, my point here, I want to go back to the Kenites, right? It says they were they were an unbelieving nation at one time as well, but they showed kindness to the children of Israel, right? And this is what I love about God. When you agree with God, listen, he going to rock with you. When you don't agree with God, then you're going to have some problems. The, the, the Kenites agreed with God. They showed kindness to the children of Israel. When they came into the land, they didn't beef with them. They opened up the doors to them. And for this kindness, God returned kindness back to them. In the New Testament, it says, Jesus said, if you give somebody a glass of water in my name, it will not be forgotten. Anytime a person, and I'll be honest with you, and I'll give my own personal testimony. Anytime I went into a business or even when I did business with, with companies that opened up their door to me or even my Jewish partner who doesn't know the Lord um, that I work with today, right? Um, um, God, he told his wife, I said this before, his wife said, since I came, their ministry, their, their business tripled, right? Anybody who opens up the door and show love to God's people, God will in turn allow them to be blessed as well. When God went to destroy the Malachites, he told the Kenites, get away, get out of there, right? He showed them kindness. Like, again, it goes back to what Jesus said in the New Testament. If you give any one of my people, any one of mine, someone, and he, when he says someone me, one of mine is a glass of water in my name, right? And you genuinely, you know, do it out of a sincere heart. God, God will remember that. God is not petty. You know, God don't look for a whole one act of kindness of genuine kindness will take you towards God's people or in agreement with God, with God's direction will take you a long way in life. A long way. 
Now back to not. Um, Saul played himself. What did God tell him? Right? God said, "Go up there and kill everything. Move." You gotta understand something about Saul. Saul had a problem, I believe, with with how God did things. Like most of us, most of us do too. Let's be real. Sometimes we look at things and we question God. We're like, "Well, why? Why I gotta go this way? Or why you did that?" I hear people that talk to me and question the Word of God all the time. But why would God just do it this way? Why wouldn't God just do it this way? Why does He do it? I don't get it. I don't. I don't like that. Right? I think Saul in his mind at times didn't agree with God. And God, I know he went into the land of Can I mean, went into the Amalekite land. He was like, man, why kill all these good sheep? Get out of here. What's the point? Ain't nothing wrong with these sheep. He gonna keep that. He kept the king alive. God said, kill the king. He's like, well, I have to kill the king. If I show this king kindness, you know, people will say Saul the great. You know, this guy shows kindness and he he began to humanize God's direction and put it in his own humanistic thoughts and tried to get his own humanistic uh, 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 conviction on how he felt it should be. And that's what we do all the time. When God says, I want you to do it this way, I want you to do it that way, we kind of like, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't get that. I'm sure Saul said that when he got into the land. He said, look at all these sheep, man. Y'all, y'all. Take the sheep, man. Do what y'all want to do with that. Split it up. You know, take the best of everything. You know, whatever's sick, no, don't take that. He he came behind God with his own humanistic views on what he what he thought was right, like we do today. Man, do that to the fifth power. You know? Like, I don't see what's the problem. I don't see what's wrong with this. Let's be right. Let's be real. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with, with God? You know, not, you know, take what's wrong with Saul taking the best of the sheep and the best of I mean, from my, my own human perspective, I don't see the big deal, but God said no. There was God was doing something that Saul disagreed with. He got in big trouble again for it. This really messed him up. When we don't agree with God, guys, this is the point. We get in trouble. We have to agree with God on everything. When God says to do it a certain way, to believe a certain way, to we got to agree. There's a lot of even ministries, let's be real, that don't agree with God. Even in the New Testament, the way God says to set up ministries and the way, you know, they don't agree with it. They do what they want to do. <laughs> they don't set the ministries up the way Paul said ministries should run and Peter and them, the way, you know, it was designed by the apostles and stuff. They just do what they want to do. They don't agree with it, right? Saul didn't agree with God, as simple as that. Verse 10, Brother Rick, to 12. You can stop at 12. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up he set up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. They said Saul set up a place for himself, like a monument or something. Like he set up a monument for himself, for his great victory. You know, um, Saul was wilding. I believe Saul was um, trying to kick God out of the situation, right? And be governed by his own humanism because he just was doing what he wanted to do. Uh, we do that. We get in these positions and get to certain, God will get us certain places. As soon as we get there, we start feeling good. We start getting comfortable. We kick God right out, run God out of it, right? When I saw that, I said, wow, he set up a monument for himself. So what the heck is Saul doing? Now, verse 10, we're going to come back to it. Skip that on purpose. We're going to jump back to verse 10. Um, keep reading, Rick, to, to the end of 21. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites 
for the people spare the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said unto Saul, Stay, and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, Say on. And Samuel said, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed thee king over Israel? And the Lord sent thee on a journey, and said, Go, and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Wherefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil, and didst did is evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. For the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. You can stop there. Okay, now, Samuel comes on the scene as we see it's self-explanatory. He said, I did everything uh, God wanted me to do, Samuel. He said, why do I hear sheep and oxen? You didn't do, you did what you wanted to do, Saul, so, right? Um, there's a lot of times we do do that. One of the worst crimes is not to take ownership. We do what we want to do, then when everything backfires, we we act like we God. I'm doing my best. I'm serving you. This is Sam. I'm trying to serve God. I'm doing. And 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 this way he really went wrong, right? This is where Saul completely went wrong here. Saul shifted the weight to the people, right? Um, they said he did the same thing Adam did in the garden, refused to take responsibility for his crime. Right. One God, one thing God wants us to do, and we said this already, is to own up. Right then and there, Saul's out was to say, you know what? I didn't agree with God. I didn't see the point, Sammy, of killing all these sheep. I know God told me to do it, but I didn't, I just didn't want to do it. I don't know what came over me, Sammy. I, I'm sorry. I just see. And then the people seemed so happy and every I got caught up. Caught up in a moment. He could have said anything else. But one thing God wants us to do is take responsibility. Take ownership when we do what we want to do and we don't listen to him. And when everything blows up, you know, when everything blows up in my face, speaking for me, I never be like, God, what happened? Oh, God, I tried. You know what I say? God, I know. I know. I, I'll just sit there with the donkey look like, <laughs> I don't even complain or say nothing to God. I just be like, I know what I did. I know why I'm going through this. I'll just take it, right? Take ownership of what we did. Saul would not, he did, the, he did to Adam. And Adam says, the woman you gave me, I swear, the responsibility felt on Saul. He was the king. He called the shots and God was behind him. You don't shift the weight. You don't blame the people you're supposed to lead and the people who's listening to you and you blame them. God said, I gave you the command. The, the Bible said creation didn't fall with Eve. It fell with Adam. It fell with Adam because the, 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 the instructions that God gave to Adam, he was responsible for Eve. He couldn't separate himself when the time came. He was supposed to own up. See, that same syndrome Adam had is in us today. We, we'll shift the weight in a minute. I, it's the wife you gave me. I think I said that to God a few times. Huh? Shift the weight. I would have did it, but, you know, this brother did his own thing, Lord. I ain't got nothing to do with me. See, God wants us to take ownership. He wants us to take responsibility. God takes responsibility. I love the scripture. He said, have I not made the blind, the deaf, the dumb? He said, do I not? He said, do I not bring calamity? God, God takes responsibility for everything. But we don't. We don't, we'll, uh, oh, because, you know, my family, you know, I was born to a broken home and, you know, my father beat me and my mother was out there. She wasn't home. We'll do whatever we can to not own up for what we do. We blame, I see, we live in a world that blames everybody and takes a bunch of pills today. 
then begins to take medication for it instead of just owning up. One thing you got to know that when we stand in front of God and we know this, we're going to be by ourselves. You know, he's not going to ask you about nobody in this ministry. He's not going to ask you about anybody. He's going to be like, don't worry about them. They behind you. You have to give an account for you. Amen, so whatever bro. you did, since you claim you knew Jesus Christ, you're going to give an account for yourself. You can't be looking, well, if I would have did it right. If Brother Calvin wouldn't have did this, Brother Ron wouldn't have did that. Alejandro told me, you know, this, I would have been all right. You cannot shift the weight. God hates that. Amen. See, that's one Amen. of the greatest crimes that, that Saul committed to me when he said, what? Uh, I it was the people, you know? I seen them taking the sheep, but I got scared. I, I didn't want to, uh-uh. You know what, Samuel, you're right. I could have said something, but you know what, Samuel? I didn't want to. I didn't see the point. I didn't understand why God would want to destroy all these sheep. And, you know, we came all the way from Israel. Then we got to go back to Israel to eat. You know, Saul was the people's champ. You know, he, he was more concerned about how the people, you know, saw him than how God saw him. And that's where we go wrong as well. Um, let me see what else I got here. Um, verse said, 21 to 23. Read all 23. Go ahead. And Samuel said, Had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Mm. For rebellion, you want to stop right there? No, keep going. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou has rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. I like what he says here. He says rebellion is as witchcraft and stubbornness, right, is as iniquity. Iniquity. Iniquity is, you know, and adultery is always linked together. Um, rebellion. Now let, let me clear something up here. What's the big deal there? Saul sent, okay. We all sin, right? Everybody sin. Why was God so hard on Saul? We all sin, right? We all make bad decisions. But Saul was accused of, of what he says to witchcraft and stubbornness. See, there's a difference when we, you know, we just give in to the flesh and when we, in our minds. See, in our minds, I'm trying to get y'all to understand something. Me and Brother Brown was talking um, earlier and we said, you know, we, we, you know, I was sharing, a, you know, we shared this before, but again, it goes back to be careful of, of those mindsets because a curse might come with that. It's a mindset that God looks at. It's not always the action because we're going to look at what David did and what Saul did, and we're going to compare them later. It's not always the action. It's the mindset. In his mind, he did not agree, and I'm being redundant here, with God at all. See, this is the key thing. That's, he said, that's like witchcraft. It's stubborn. When you want to, you know, once you know clearly what I'm telling you to do and how to do it, and you be like, man, I don't agree with that. I'm going to do what I want. It's different when somebody, we said a couple of weeks ago, is struggling, trying to do what God wants them to do. And we know God is right. Lord, I'm in agreement with you, but my flesh is like a foot. I don't see that's. I keep tripping over that stand. You know, somebody keeps putting their foot out. That's how my flesh is like a foot out that I don't see that keeps tripping me. That's different. Saul was, was a sinner, but he was in a different place mentally. In his mind, he had a whole different concept of what he wanted to do as king than what God was doing. And that, that caused a problem for Saul. It caused a problem for us too as well. All right? That's why Paul says something profound. He said, with the mind, I serve God, and with the flesh, I serve sin, right? In other words, even though at times my flesh don't seem to be doing things the way it should be, or I make bad decisions, I fall short. He said, but make no mistakes. My, mind's, my mind is fortified and in harmony and in perfect agreement with God's direction and what God is doing, period. Amen, brother. Amen. All right? So again, uh, 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 Saul was in big trouble. First, I wrote something here. Was God's judgment too harsh? And I said this. I mean, we all sin, right? 
Saul, was Saul any different? I've said that. Why was God so extra? I answered that. Again, because God disagreed with God in his heart. He didn't. You know, there's millions of people that fall and, and profess Christ on a high level, but fall in the same place mentally that Saul is in right now. All right, keep reading, uh, Brother Rick. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king of, over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. All right, stop right there. We're going to go back there. But in verse 24, I like what it says here, right? It says that it's not that Saul cared for Samuel, but he feared that if Samuel forsook him, the people will do so too, right? And my point is, is that it was self-preservation. Saul went into Saul. He said, man, I know the people love Samuel. They follow Samuel. They've seen all the great things Samuel did. They know Samuel anointed me as king. If he turned on me, they're going to turn on me too. I, I got to do something here. He went into self-preservation mode. So he grabbed Samuel and, you know, please, like, don't do this because the people will turn. Again, self-preservation, right? The problem again, Saul agreed with the people over God, right? He was the people's champ. But in that mindset, he became God's enemy. Again, we always got to be on God's side against everything and everyone at all times, guys. I mean, as simple as that. We learned this from Saul. Saul got in big trouble trying to make people happy. If trying, he can't make everybody happy, you know, especially if they don't know the Lord. Sometimes you got to take a clear stand against them and let them know, look, that's the direction you're going. That's how you're going to believe. This is where our friendship ends. This is where this is going to stop. I can't go no further with you. I love you, though, you know? So, Saul, though, again, he wanted he wanted to be accepted by the people more than he wanted than he cared about his relationship with God. And this led him down, begin to go down, like Mike said, down the toilet with the turds there. Um, verse 29, though, is powerful. Read verse 29 again, Rick. We're going to stay on this for a second. Also, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Okay, now go to verse 10, Rick. Read verse 10 again. It repented me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he has, he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Now, we have a problem here. Houston, we have a problem. In verse 29, he said, he said, um, how did he say it? He said, let me read it. He said, he said, and also the strength of Israel will not lie or, nor repent. And then right here in verse 10, he said, it repenteth me that I have made Saul king. Now, it seems like a paradox. So we have a problem. Or a little, how you say is the word ambiguous, right? Did God repent? Does God repent? Why would a God, a holy God, have to repent? What is this? What's going on here? Sometimes we read past things. But one thing you got to understand is that you know, the unbelievers don't read past scriptures. Like People who come against Christianity and what we believe and why we believe what we believe, the, the naysayers, the gang says, whatever you call them, the opponents, they'll jump on scriptures like that and they'll trip you up with them. And you'll read it and don't have no answers because you, you know, again, a lot of us, me and Brother Mike was talking about somebody we love and we care about, um, how learning how to rightfully, rightfully divide the word of truth is just as important as preaching the word of truth. We have to be ready in these times, and we have to be under teaching ministries that get us ready, that get us ready. Mike said you can't skip past that process. Now, here's my point, right? We see here, it said, it repented me that I may saw him. Then he said, should the Lord repent in verse 29? 
I got something here I want to read to you guys real fast. And I like it. I did my little homework. I stopped there to challenge you guys and to give an answer as well, to do both. It says in the old it says in the old testament, in the old testament does not correspond to the new testament word for repentance. In the new testament, repentance is technically a religious word associated with conversion. And you will miss this. The Hebrew word and the Greek words don't coincide. When we hear it, like John said, to repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Or, you know, it's always associated with a man's behavior or how can I say a man's um, uh, conversion to God. That's not talking about that in the Old Testament. It has, like in the Old Testament, there's only kind of one word for it. Like I told you in the, in the Hebrew and the Greek, it'll be 10, 10, like there's like nine words for love and there's 10 words for, for this. And it's different words in the Hebrew and different words in, in the Greek for one, one English word. But for some reason in this particular text, it's in, and when you see repentance, it's only one word in the Hebrew. But he said it doesn't coincide with the Greek the way the Greek uses it's different. So we got to get to the bottom of it. And sometimes as referring to man is different when it refers to God. It has a different connotation if we don't know the Hebrew and understand like the Hebrew, the way they write. And again, it goes back to if you want to be a teacher, teachers receive a greater condemnation. If you don't understand the, the, how they write and their, the way they, you know, make their points, so to speak, we'll miss it. Right now, the word here means to, they said, to relent, right? To be grieved, to comfort, express sympathy. I want to stay there, right? Also means you could change to God to change his mind. I want you to remember that change mind. And here it says express. It means it has different, it's applied in different scriptures different, right? In the New Testament, right? What does it mean, right? It means a change of any of all elements, right? Life, attitude, thoughts, behavior. It's different. It's not the same here. It's two different things going on here, right? We'll miss it. Now, as referring to this text, I believe, right, that God is what? Saying what? When he says, they repent of me that I made Saul. All right, let me go back to it. I have it here. In my Again, we got to get to the bottom of it. God does not. We do. It means that He's expressing sympathy, meaning that this dude saw. It means to lay out, to cry out with a deep sigh, too. Like, oh, ah, oh, this guy, right? This guy, this king, this king of mine, right? I got it. You know, God doesn't take no pleasure in dealing with his creation, even when they're wrong. He doesn't take, you know, God is not an android or a robot or a you know, the Bible says we're created in his image and his likeness. We have a lot of his characteristics. God cares. He's concerned. You know, it takes no thought. I remember years ago, I had a friend. I had to do something, too, that I loved and I cared about. And I had to do it. And I felt horrible about it. Right? It, it bothered me. I didn't take no pleasure in it. God is not up in heaven taking pleasure in dealing with his creation. No. He's not a robot. He's not an android. Right? He cares. Right? So in this particular text, I believe it's saying God, you know, is letting out a, a deep sigh. Right? On being sympathetic. Like, oh, brother, this dude, man. Samuel. This king of mine. Right? I want to finish reading it, and then I'll go to the, to the next text. Now, it says, in the Old Testament, the word is used mainly with God as the subject and simply denotes a change in his administration. It says, but God's overall plan at the same time is always salvation, meaning God is still in line with his salvation plan because, you know, Jesus came, right? He came. No matter what was going on with the kings and everything that didn't listen to God, that did listen, that did listen to God, God's plan still prevailed through it all. Even at times, God was grieved about things, like even Saul. Right? But in the New Testament, I like, I like, I mean, in the Old Testament, I like what it says here. Let me say, right? It says, but a change in human um instrumentally is we cry here, meaning that 
when he says a change in his administrations, meaning the changes of kings, you had good kings, you had bad kings. They came and went. Throughout it all, Jesus still came. He still came. He still was born. It never changed God's plan, salvation. We're on his phone. We know the Lord to get today. Millions came into Christ. Nothing stops it. But at times God has, the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. Like we could grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve Some of the decisions that Holy Spirit has to watch us make is not like he's just sitting there, not in touch, in tune. He's grieved, right? In this particular text, I believe God was grieved. Like, oh, bro, this dude here, right? But as we're laying to chapter 29, I believe it's a little different. In chapter 29, I believe God is just technically saying, right, that he will not change his mind, right? Once he issued out that, that decree on Saul, he said it's done, right? I'm not up and down like man. I'm not wishy-washy. Like me, I'm wishy-washy. One minute, I'll be like, that's it for me. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Next minute, I'll be like, ah, oh, man, I don't think I want to do that. Maybe I won't do that. God is not like us. He's not flip-flopping. He's not going to change his mind. Once he issued out that decree on Saul, Saul was done. He was finished. His attitude and his mindset towards God was, was not good. And it led him to have to be removed uh, from being king of Israel. And technically, that's what it's saying, right? Nevertheless, I'm going to say this again. In the New Testament, I said, nevertheless, in the Old Testament, it isn't referring to the changing of one's life as in the New Testament. Again, it's different. It's used differently. Okay? Any questions before I move? Yeah, I just want to say that. I want to say that's powerful points, the points you're making, brother. Um about Saul, how he cared more about what the people think than what God thought. Uh, I love that. Um, you know, most of my, when I first got saved, in the beginning of my Christianity, I thought it was all about what I was doing, how to get my morals in order, you know? And then God had to move me into understanding this about souls, you know? It's about being in line with his will, his direction, and out here doing the work of the Lord. There's a lot of people doing a lot of things, and they're doing a whole lot of nothing, you know, unfortunately, as far as the kingdom's concerned. But God has people that we all responsible for in this call. Y'all all have personal ministries. We say this all the time in this ministry. There's people that God's going to connect y'all with that needs the gospel. And God has put the gospel in you so you can share it with them, with your personality and your uniqueness. So you have to okay. fulfill your personal ministry. That's what this Bible study is about. It's about giving you all the tools you need to fulfill your personal ministry. We're just not on this Bible study trying to sound deep and get people together so we can just hear ourselves talk. It's really about our personal ministries. Another thing you said I like, brother, is that spoils the war. You know, like how, how the, um, Saul, he wanted to spoil the war, you know? And literally, is the Old Testament is literal, but the New Testament is spiritual. But it's like us, we go through a battle, we go through something, and we're looking for the spoils of war. You know, God gave us his grace. God kept us through it. God didn't let that thing kill us. You know, some things we could have lost our life in certain areas. And then when God keeps us, and we're looking for, we still looking for the spoils of war after that. We're still looking for something else. You know, God says, so I established you. I gave you these things. We like, we're still looking for some type of extra tangible reward outside of the fact that those in Christ Jesus going to reign in heaven with Jesus forever in the kingdom. We're still looking for the spoils of war in our life. Got to be careful looking for the spoils of war or spoils of, of, of things you go through or just looking for a reward, you know? And uh, lastly, the humanistic mind. The humanistic mind, our mind gets in the way. I like what you said, brother. It's not the actions. So I don't want to go ahead of you because I know you're going to talk about David and compare what they both did, but it's not, it's not the action. It's the mindset and the attitude, you know? People just hate, they, they think, people. there's people that walk the earth that think God don't know what, they, what he's doing. There's some people that look at God and think God, God, God's plan is foolish, you know? And they're among us. There's people out here with that mindset that feel like God just don't know what he's doing. God shouldn't do it like that. Why did he send Jesus? Why did he do? They just think the way God works is, is, is utter foolishness to them. And those people are dangerous people. Those people are the ones we got to be careful of. Those are the ones 
that will that will basically shipwreck everything around you. You know, if you if you're too close with them people, so that mindset is what God hates, and that's the mindset, unfortunately, Saul had. That's why, you know, he eventually you'll see what happens eventually. I want to go ahead of the brother. That's all I wanted to say, beloved. Hey Amen. If I may add, um, I thought you touched on some powerful things. Uh, but I, guys, I did put in the chat group uh, the uh, Strong's Exhausted Concordian, so you guys can really follow along with Bishop and Brother Mike and get a copy of that for yourself if you guys are interested. But I, I like something you said. I want to really harp on it. Um, what I thought was powerful when um, you made mention of the garden, because I, I saw that same thing, that same tonality uh, of the garden reared its ugly head in Samuel. And uh, it's amazing how uh, suave, as I call uh, Satan, as he's able to uh, convince someone. Like, I mean, just think for the fact that, that Saul looked dead <laughs> in Samuel's eyes and literally lied right to his face, you know, basically saying that, he had followed all of the, he had obeyed the voice of God. He had obeyed, he had done it when it said uh, uh, utterly. Uh, and again, looking up that word, seeing utterly means complete, mean to completely destroy. You know, how in the world did you completely destroy? When <laughs> I love how Sam says, I hear that bad, you know, of the sheep. Uh, so he didn't do that. And, and the fact is, and, and I like something you said, Bishop, that in his own mind, he, he saw his truth, <laughs> you know, not God's truth, but he saw his truth. Uh, and that was that was something worth noting also. But I also want to say something that you said that really stands out. You know, you got a lot of uh, people in today's, uh, uh, I, I don't know, these organizations today, they call them churches, that still struggle tremendously with the things that God uh, as, as a, an ordained us to do, you know? And I like what you said, the Old Testament, uh, more uh, supernatural, more uh, vivid, more graphic, a little bit more covert in today's operation. But I do have to say this. I mean, too many, in my opinion, too many of these so-called organizations, you know, for the sake of, I don't know, memberships, for the sake of keeping their doors open to all people, as they like to say, hey, come on, we, you know, we want everyone to come in outdoors. We're here to talk to everybody. But I see that that that's that's that that anti-Christ-like ideology that they allow to fellowship with them for the sake of so-called opening up the doors for everybody. And uh, I really wish that uh, today's ministries would take a much harder stance uh, when it comes to these types of, of, of demonic things that, um, I don't know, that's kind of explained away like, there's no way God would have a problem with some of the things that we see vividly in today's society. And I love the fact that we, uh, you know, we call it for what it is. That's all I had. Amen. That's powerful. Brother Rick, take us home. Let's finish out 29. You read it 30 on in and I'll close out. Then he said, I have sinned yet honor me. Now I pray thee before the elders of my people and before Israel. And turn again with me, that I may worship the Lord thy God. So Samuel turned again after Saul, and Saul worshipped the Lord. Then said Samuel, Bring ye hither to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him delicately. And Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. And Samuel said, As thy sword hath made women childless, so shall thy mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gil Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house to Gibeah of Saul. And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. Okay, you can stop. There goes back to hmm. the Lord has sympathy, felt sorry that he made Saul, you know, king, that he had to deal with Saul. God was going to deal with him. God don't take no pleasure in that, dealing with us. He really doesn't. Um, I want to say this too, right? And this is referring to feeling sorry. I thought about men on this phone. Let me, let me give you an application. Let me move a little bit away from 
from what God, you know, feeling sorry. One thing we don't want as men of God, we don't want people to feel sorry for us, right? I don't want, especially the women in your life, your children, your family, your friends, you don't want people looking at you, you know, feeling sorry for you, looking at you like, oh, man, you know? Men of God, we should be those people that people should look to, to want to come to when they are in a bad way, when they have in making bad decisions, when they're going through, we should be the people that they come to, you know, for, you know, spiritual guidance, for instruction, you know, to get back, you know, in that place with God that they need to get back to, not looking at us, feeling sorry for us, <laughs> feeling bad about our lives and what we doing and what we not doing, about the decisions we making. We don't want to be those people either, right? But let me go back a little further. I like the way Samuel handled that. You know, it never talks about Samuel fighting and swinging his, swinging his sword ever. Now, I'm sure he had to on a few occasions, but never mentions it. But this one time, you know, when Saul said, uh, you know, Saul told Samuel, Samuel went to walk away and he grabbed him and said, please, man, don't do this to me. Uh, come, you know, come worship with me. The people are going to turn to me. And I believe Saul strategically used that to his advantage. He probably looked at that king over there and said, you know what, Saul? You're right. Let me worship with you. Come on, let's pray. He already knew Saul's fate was done. And when they finished praying, he said, by the way, bring Haggai over. Bring the king over here. Bring the king, Malachi king. I want to holler. I want to holler. And Samuel cut him to pieces and probably looked at Saul and said, this is what you should have did and left. Said he never came back. Worship with Saul, spoke to Saul again, and it broke his heart. It breaks our heart when we have to separate from the people we started in ministry with that we felt like we was going to do something for the Lord with. It hurts us. Amen, brother. Amen. It broke Samuel's heart. He loved Saul. It was like his son. And when we got to step away from him, he said he mourned for Saul. Mm. Amen, brother. When we wow. know men of God and people that's supposed to be in that, in the purpose and in, you know, in God's direction, and they begin to misdirect. And even though we can't fellowship them, we step apart from them. We move for them. We don't feel like we're better than them or we have a higher quality or higher relationship that they have. We never should feel that way. We, we should mourn. It should break our hearts when we got to step away from people we thought we was going to really go hard for God with. Amen, brother. Preach it now. Stanley, it broke his heart. You know? And that's all we're going to, you know, that's the, that's it for today. You know? We got a lot Amen. more to come. We got a lot more to come. Amen? Amen, brother. Powerful.